and I'll start with an overview. Um, in regard to Judeo-Spanish or Ladino, I'll say that many of you are likely familiar with uh, the roots of the language. Um, Judeo-Spanish comes from Separan, the Iberian Peninsula, when the Jews lived in Spain and Portugal, or what is today Spain and Portugal. Um, we're talking about prior to the 15th century when they were expelled, right? So prior to the 15th century, Jewish communities spoke the different varieties of Romance, Iberian Romance languages that were spoken in each of their communities. Judeo-Spanish really came about following the, the expulsion of the Sephardim in Spain in 1492 and later years um, as well at the end of the 15th century. There's some research as to what, ha what did the Jews speak in Spain and Portugal um, prior to then, and was this Ladino, was this a Jewish variety? And so there's some research on that. But the real focus of what Judeo-Spanish Judeo is or has become is essentially what happened following 1492 and in the years after the expulsion from the Jews from Spain and later Portugal. So that's what I'll be speaking about. The term Sephardab itself does refer to not just Spain like in Hebrew, but the Iberian Peninsula. And you are probably familiar with Sephardic Jews, Sephardi Jews who um, trace their origins to this area where you see on the map. Now I recognize that for many, the word Sephardab or Sephardim has kind of become a term to encompass anyone who is not Ashkenazi, right? Um, but in this case, I'll try to strict, uh, stick to a, a strict sense, um, at least in regard to the Ladino speaking communities that have emerged um, following this period. So the Sephardic migration or the migration of Sephardi Jews after their expulsion from, from Sephardad or Spain and Portugal um, is quite um, multi-layered. Um, for Judeo-Spanish, the purposes of the language for which I'll be speaking today, I am going to refer to Sephardic Jews who settled primarily throughout Turkey and the Balkans. So I'm speaking about the Ottoman Empire, uh, former Ottoman Empire, but I'm also speaking about cities throughout North Africa as well. Um, you'll see on this one map uh, that migration of Sephardim um, is quite diverse. Um, and this is only in the centuries following. Um, what this map does not include are several satellite communities that established themselves, not just in North Africa, but in other parts of Africa, um, like in Zimbabwe, for example, where a Jewish community, Sephardic Jewish community also emerged. But today I'll be focusing on um, the communities in pretty much this area, if you can see, um, which is in the yellow of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, Greece, the Balkans. Okay, so as far as nomenclature, um, here's a little word word cloud that I created. Now it's not, um, it doesn't have to do with, um, as far as data of how common um, certain terms are used. It's just kind of a visual representation of some of the terms and repeated terms that you'll see or come across. And there are certain nuances for what the language refers to. Um, this is common across languages as we know, and well for Jewish language as well, um, for many people, the language that they spoke that we're speaking about today was just Spanish, simply Spanish or Spanish, maybe Muestro Spanish, our Spanish, right? Um, but for others, it was not just Spanish, it was Judeo or maybe even Judaismo, right? Something that was Jewish, a Jewish language. Keep in mind, in most cases, Sephardim were kind of, after several generations, lost contact with Spain, did not really keep up with the um, developments and in many cases we're not even really even aware that their Spanish was not the Spanish and there's some you know testimonies where several generations later or even centuries later um, Sephardim who spoke Spanish when they heard other people speaking Spanish would assume that oh they must be Jews as well because Spanish is a Jewish language right um, the construct of this language is primarily 15th century Castilian but there are linguistic elements from a variety of other Ibero Romance languages, right? Aragonese, Catalan, uh, Portuguese, for example. Um, and they came into contact with each other in different ways following the expulsion of the Sephardim because of prestige, because of a number of factors. Castilian kind of became the base of what this Judeo Spanish language is. So, as far as the nomenclature, it's quite diverse. Um, and I'll say that um, if we want to go to the well, Spanish dictionary the, of the Real Academia Española, the Royal Academy, of Spanish, we see the word Ladino, you might be familiar with the, the word Ladino in other contexts. Ladino doesn't always refer to this Jewish language uh, that we're speaking about today. But if we look at points 
7 and 8. Uh, point 7 actually has to do with a religious uh, language of Sephardim, which refers to a calc. And I'll speak about what that means. It's very, um, there's a few terms in there that are worth revisiting, but it refers to primarily what we might consider to be a written variety of the language. And then also point eight um, says Judeo-Spanish, kind of alluding to the fact that this is maybe synonymous with Ladino. Um, and then if we kind of parse that out a little bit more, there's just different options as far as what Judeo-Spanish means, the variety of Spanish spoken by Sephardim, primarily in Israel, Asia Minor, Africa, the Balkans, characterized by conserving many features um, of Castilian Spanish prior to, and here we have the 16th century. Um, but we, the nomenclature continues if we want to talk about Haketia, which we'll touch upon a little bit today. Haketia is a variety of Judeo-Spanish that was primarily spoken and developed in Morocco um, and satellite communities afterward, right? So we'll see um, even today speakers um, in France, in Israel, of course, in the United States, and in autonomous regions in Spain, even like Ceuta and Melilla. So we'll speak a little bit about Haketia as well. The word Ladino, um, which we'll get into more, um, you might see a lot of times people talking about Ladino. It has become the most recognized term. There's a national authority of Ladino now in Israel for the past several decades. Um, there's a lot of discussion and debate on what to call this language. I'm sure as many of you think about languages you speak or have studied, there's conversation about that as well. Um, Ladino can often refer to a very particular type of language, which we'll see some examples of later. So depending on the level of detail or even the conversation at hand, you might um, have people disagree or, you know, have a preferred term for the language. But in general, I'll, I'll try to use some of these terms synonymously, recognizing that there might be some nuances that separate them as well, especially if we want to talk about linguistic ones. Okay, so um, let's speak a bit then about the language families. Now, I'll keep this part somewhat simple um, just because it can be quite complex. Uh, first and foremost, Ladino is a Romance language and linguistically that is what it is best characterized as, right? It's a Romance language. Um, the conversation, which I know you touched upon in previous lectures about language and dialect, it's a very political one. Um, Ladino is to a great deal mutually intelligible to Spanish. So that means if you speak Spanish, you're going to understand a good amount of Ladino, not all Ladino. And that might depend on if you're seeing Ladino written or hearing it, but it's certainly a Romance language, right? And the important thing is, and something that I always tell people as, you know, a linguist myself is that not just focus so much on, is this a language or is this a dialect of Spanish? Because you can make that argument even with Spanish and French and Italian now, these dialects of, of Latin, right? I mean, where do you draw the line? What's most important as a people who grew up with this language centuries ago, or even a century ago, or even in recent decades, this was their language. This is what they had, this grammar, this uh, in, their, in their head. So for them, it's a language, right? And it doesn't matter that it's connected to any other language, it's their language. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, but as far as connections and clearly the um, having Ladino as part of this series, it's a Jewish language as well, which means there are a number of characteristics which Sarah touched upon in previous lectures, which make this variety of Romance language different um, than others, and also similar to other Jewish languages that you'll be seeing throughout this series. And also important is that it's an Ottoman language. And I say an Ottoman language here, it doesn't get as much attention um, as the Judeo-Spanish faction, but what really allowed this language to develop and thrive and be preserved was due to the setting where the Sephardim landed post-expulsion. They were allowed certain liberties in the Malay system where they could self-govern. They had auto autonomy to a large degree. Um, and that allowed them to preserve their language for a number of centuries, right? And develop their language. Um, and that's really important. Uh, that's not necessarily the case with Hakatia, which we'll speak a little bit more later, but that's important to keep in mind, like the cultural context and the historical context of where Judeo-Spanish developed allowed it to be preserved in a way um, that might not be familiar with others. And that's something also that we saw a few weeks ago when I think Sarah said that, you know, in the case of Yiddish and Ladino, they're kind of anomalies in regard to, or they are anomalies in regard to Jewish languages. And we'll see that um, as we go throughout this lecture, 
why that might be the case, right? Um, okay, so regional dialects, like languages have, um, they, Judeo-Spanish has two primary um, varieties. And if we use Judeo-Spanish as kind of an, um, an umbrella term for the language, Eastern Judeo-Spanish refers to the language that was spoken in areas of Turkey, Greece, the Balkans, for example, and Western Judeo-Spanish is in regard to um, Hakakia, which was um, in Morocco. So let's let's just listen to a couple of examples because I think that that will speak volumes. Um, so I will play one example for you, just maybe the first minute and a half. I want you to see an example of Eastern Judeo-Spanish, um, and then I'll eventually play something for you from Hakakia. Havia um marido mulher. Estavam casados 10 anos. O marido la queria muito bem a mulher. Ah, mas a mulher não era nem cochirá. Não sabia guisar, não sabia dar roti, não sabia fazer boios, borecas, não sabia nada. Ah, mas o marido la queria mais muito bem. Um dia um caia mal e a mulher se hizo casina. Hazina, Hazina, no diciendo un cara de ninguno, la mujer se murió. Y el marido estuvo un año entero llorando y buscándola. Al cabo, los amigos ya se agidiaron de él. Le conocieron una otra mujer a la contra de esta primera. La segunda mujer sabía guisar, sabía hacer bollos, borrecas, sabía dar uti, sabía todo. Era muy, muy viva mujer. Un día, él estaba echado a la cama, se quiso levantar, ella corrió presto, presto, le trocho los zapatos. This is Ladino. Some of you might say, well, this sounds like Spanish to me. And if that's the case, then, then yes, it very much is. But I'm sure there are certain elements also that you hear um, that maybe don't sound so familiar. You likely heard the word mujer with a j sound, um, buscar with a ch sound for mujer being a woman and buscar to, to look for. We'll speak about some of the particular um, differences a little bit later, but aside from sounds, you might have noticed some vocabulary that you weren't familiar with, uh, familiar with if you speak Spanish. Nicuchera is a word for like a good housewife, I guess similar to Maybe Balabusta in Yiddish, Nikucharas from Greek. Um, you also have Chazina, um, you have Ajideyar from Turkish. You have a periphrastic construction of uh, Dar Uti, Dar from Spanish to give. And Uti is an iron in Turkish. So to iron is Dar Uti instead of Planchar, like in Spanish. So there's a number of things that are happening in this speech of what we can say is Eastern Judeo Spanish. Um, that are different than other varieties of Spanish. And um, by that, I mean non-Judeo-Spanish varieties. Let's hear an example now of an, um, a man who speaks Hakatia. And so this example, the one you just heard was by Esther Levy. And the next one is going to be from Baruch Garzon. And let's hear him speak Hakatia. And see also as you listen, if you could hear things that are different from maybe Spanish, if you are familiar with Spanish, or maybe even things that are different from the Eastern Judeo Spanish variety that you just heard. Venido bueno y venido claro a todos, y con bien poder entre la salida Pascua. Sabréis que yo nací en el Sánchez de Tetuán, pero me crié en la judería, en casa de mi abuela, Rahel Garzón, que llamaban. Señora Jolla, y la amiga la llamaba Jolí. Era una casa de patín con montera y baranda florida, con moradas altas, caos de azulejos y vecinos que eran como hermanos, unos ricos, otros pobres, lo que el Dios le dio a cada uno, pero todo de hermanos. El aljad se sabonaba la ropa, se tendía en la azotea, se planchaba con plancha de carbón y se guardaba en la comodá y el baúl. Si entraba carne de la jornada, o hacíamos la cola en la carnicería. Pata para la fina, ¿quién y quién la alcanzaba? Y si ya te la daban, ¿cuál era la los y traerla para limpiarla? 
¿Qué de Tamara, mi bueno? El lunes se mercaba la comida, de ello en las tiendas, y de ello en los moros del campo que mostrarían las verduras, hasta los rabanitos para Zabá, y las frutas, mi bueno. ¿Qué fruta? Ah, más como la de Agora, que todo sabe a plástico, ah, bueno está. So you see the mutual intelligibility of these varieties uh, compared to the Spanish that you might speak, um, which might have, not have anything to do with Ladino. But comparing the two varieties, there are a number of similarities, right? Um, the word Dio for God, for example, the word Al-Had for Sunday, um, the word Mercar for to buy. But there are also differences, not necessarily that were used in the example by Esther Levy, but you might have noticed that this speaker used the word Planchar for to iron. Right, and he likely wouldn't be using dar uti because the Turkish elements would not have necessarily transferred to the Moroccan context, right, where this Judeo-Spanish developed. Um, but you might have also noticed that there are certain sounds that he, this speaker used that weren't found in Esther's um, Judeo-Spanish, and that could be likely attributed to the Arabic faction of uh, contact with Judeo-Spanish of Morocco, haqqatiya. Also words from Arabic, like hatta, which is still you know, similar to uh, the Spanish hasta, right? Um, so there's a, a lot of things that are going on in regard to both varieties and also even it makes an interesting case to compare them as well. Um, so let's continue then. Okay. You know, if we want to go into further um, degrees of dialect variation, we can. I won't get into too much um, information on this because it can get very meta and also very detailed, which is a good thing, to be honest, because there's a lot of research on Judeo-Spanish. And even though, um, you know, it's it's not as well known as many of us would like within the context of, well, the United States or even just Spanish-speaking communities around the world, uh, within the, the realm of Judeo or Jewish languages, it is, as Sarah mentioned, um, has gained a lot of popularity recently, um, and I guess exposure as well. Um, Judeo-Spanish, though, can be further broken down, Eastern Judeo-Spanish, um, based on Northwest varieties, Western, Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia, well, what was Yugoslavia, Austria, and Hungary, and Southeast, Eastern Judeo-Spanish, Greece, Turkey, and Eastern Bulgaria. And David Bunis, this is just one example from his 1992 article um, about the historical overview, um, is a great resource for anyone who's really interested in learning about variation in Judeo-Spanish. David Bunis is a great example. Aldina uh, Gitana is another one as well, um, who have documented all the dialectology of the language. And I say this, and I mention these points because, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Judeo-Spanish is not just a language. It's a language with a, wor with a world of variation, um, as we might expect, right? Um, you know, one study that I really like to mention, not only because I'm from New York and live in New York, um, is one that Max Loria in 1911 published on Judeo-Spanish dialects in New York City. And I say it's important just because, you know, New York City at the start of the 20th century uh, was home to a large Sephardi population um, who essentially came to New York for a variety of reasons. Many include the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at, around that time. Um, but you'll see all the different cities that he mentions and, you know, for which he refers to as dialects, and if you're able to follow along in his transcription, you'll see the very subtle nuances uh, or degrees of differentiation between a word like 400, whether it's cuatrocientos, cuatrocientos, if we skip to cuatrocientos, cuatrocientos, small variation in, in what he refers to as dialects in New York City. And he gives a list of different words. Here we have the word judio, which is pronounced either judio, 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 uh, judio. And I'll say here, you'll also notice if you speak Spanish that the stress is on the final vowel as opposed to the I, um, like in Spanish. So this is an interesting case from, well, over 100 years ago at this point, where um, there's some documentation already on Judeo-Spanish and its variation. All right, Ladino. So this has to do with what some of you I know are thinking in regard to um, the language in writing. In the strictest of the senses, Ladino does refer to a calc variety, and I'll explain what that is, of the language. This is something that Sarah mentioned in her previous lectures, where a number of Jewish languages, um, especially for sacred texts, liturgical texts, will 
translate word for word from a Hebrew or Aramaic source into the local language um, to maintain maybe an element of that holiness or, or that of the sacred text, for example. So there are written materials in Ladino, like the Bible or the Passover Haggadah, Pirkei Avod, Ethics of Our Fathers, um, a daily, daily prayer books that are in Ladino that are in writing, and I'll speak about the alphabet a little bit later, that follow a word-for-word -word translation. So I'll give an example about this with something that is um, familiar to some of you, the counting of the Omer, um, which I'll speak about a little bit more. Um, so this counting of the Omer is going to be um, what you see here is in the middle, uh, the Ladino uh, variety. And what you see on the right side is going to be in Hebrew. And I'll switch it a little bit to uh, a transcription that I, I, I will provide. This is from Libro de Tequila con Ladino from Vienna at the end of, uh, well, 1891 in particular. And you'll see as you compare, I'm not sure, I mean, our, let's see, by show of hands, are, are, is anyone able to um, read the middle part? Okay, this is in Rashi characters, which we'll speak about in a minute. But this text says, dia uno a el omer, dos dias a el omer. And it continues. And as you, as you review this, you might realize that the syntax looks a little bit different than Spanish if you know Spanish. If you don't know Spanish, then this might not look um, any different to you. But the important thing to know is that this is what is the calc variety. So here we have um, pretty much a copy and paste, right? That's one way to explain it. So dia is day, omer is the counting, and I should actually maybe specify this is the period of time um, between Passover, the holiday Passover, and the holiday of Shavuot. It's uh, seven weeks, right, that you, you count until you get to, to, to the holiday of, of Shavuot. And omer is essentially the count. And we could discuss that a little bit more later. But um, what we have here is, especially if you look at siete días a el Omer que ellos semana una, then you'll see that, for example, this syntax literally follows the um, variety that we see in the Rashi characters. Seven days to the Omer, seven days to the Omer que ellos, and I think that this is probably just because it's from Shehem, right, that they are literally one week. So this is a copy-paste variety that was used in writing, um, and even for oral purposes as well, which were then put into writing. So that's something to keep in mind if, you're, if you've ever come across someone who is adamant about Ladino not being used as the term for the spoken language, but rather the written language. Um, nonetheless, most speakers of the language today recognize at least that it's become the most popular term for the language, especially within Eastern Judeo-Spanish varieties. All right, let's talk about some distinctive features though. Um, and I'll start with just this image that you see on the screen. So here you have, it's not a full transcription, and if any of you are familiar with um, IPA transcriptions, um, what I've put here is um, the transcription of just some sounds in question. So in Judeo-Spanish, um, and I'll focus a little bit, mostly this presentation on Eastern Judeo-Spanish, I should know, you have a word like gente for people, gente for people, and if I were going to write it, I would write it in, you know, Ladino orthography of, of today, D-J-E-N-T-E, -E, but this is gente, and we have that word, that sound in English, gente, right? Like in judge. Um, you also have uh, the word ojos, ojos. And this is just the, well, I'm here and putting them in brackets for the allophone in question, but it's also phoneme in Judeo-Spanish. Ojos, you have the just sound in English also in a word like measure. Um, and that means eyes. And then you have the word pasharo, or also pronounced at times pasharo in Ladino, which is the word for just a bird. Right, um, and that's the sh sound like we have in English as well, shopping or show. Now you might be comparing this already to the Spanish that you're familiar with or have learned, uh, if that is the case. And you compare this to Spanish gente, ojos, or pájaro. And I'm putting in the transcription an X, recognizing that there's a degree of variation even in Spanish on how strong or retracted this sound is between gente, gente, or gente. All right, depending where you are in the Spanish-speaking world. But what you'll see is that in Spanish. All of these three sounds that we see in Ladino or observe in Ladino have collapsed into one. But Ladino has preserved these sounds. And it shows a number, I mean, it's important for historical reasons as well, because these were the sounds that were part of um, not just Ladino, but that were part of old Spanish, right? If we want to say Castilian in the past. So Ladino being 
outside of the Iberian Peninsula for centuries, centuries was able to preserve elements of the language uh, that are no longer preserved. Gente, ojos, pasharo. And these sounds are actually very important. And I mentioned them because there's been a lot of research, including some of my own, about the um, how these sounds help preserve the language even today. So one um, study that I like to cite often is by Jillian Kushner Bishop in her research on Judeo-Spanish in Israel. But she notes that the retention of three sibilants, so the three sounds that I referenced before, j, j, and sh, um, where in modern Spanish only one remains, h, is perhaps the most pronounced phonological distinction today between Judeo-Spanish and modern Spanish, not to mention the one most jealously guarded by Judeo-Spanish speakers. So here her point is that Judeo-Spanish speakers, even though there's a lot of times where there's contact or there might even be some replacement of Judeo-Spanish with what she calls modern Spanish, as many of us actually do, um, referring to peninsular and Latin American varieties of the language, um, these three sounds are really um, preserved among speakers to distinguish between their variety of Spanish, Judeo-Spanish. It's not always the case as, as a number of, um, well, as some scholarship has shown. Um, but to this point, speaking about the, the language a bit more, if we go to an article that was written by Wale and Shaul, we see that this follows the trajectory I mentioned a little bit earlier about the preservation of sounds, right? And the IJSP here just refers to um, his, their study on Istanbul Judeo-Spanish, or this, the Judeo-Spanish spoken in Istanbul, where you essentially had disho, ojo, and gente, right? These three different phonemes which came about from Old Spanish, and I can get more into that at another point as to um, the distribution or um, the development of these sounds as well. But as far as other sounds and sibilants in Istanbul Judeo-Spanish, you also have a distinction between an S sound and a Z sound which is not the same distribution that you have anymore in Spanish, right? So you have a word like pasa, casa, brazo, azer. Uh, this gets more complicated as you go throughout the different varieties of Judeo-Spanish or Eastern Judeo-Spanish in particular, but um, uh, it just also shows that there's still elements of Judeo-Spanish that are preserved from um, the past that are no longer preserved in other varieties. If you're familiar with Spanish today, um, you likely say, Pasa, casa, brazo, hacer. And if you speak a variety that's more common to areas of Spain or some areas of Spain, you might say um, brazo and hacer, but that theta sound is not used in Spanish. So one thing that I see a lot is that people who are not so familiar with Ladino um, or haven't maybe studied it as much uh, might say Ladino is an archaic language. It's, it's an old language. And this is likely why, because there are elements of old Spanish if we want to simplify it as such, um, in Ladino. And that's a fair point. But it's important to keep in mind also, Ladino is not just an old language, uh, it's a current language. And that's why some people, some of us don't like to use modern Spanish, because if we talk about modern Spanish versus Judeo-Spanish, that means that Judeo-Spanish is no longer modern. And as we'll see a little bit later, it, it's still modern, it's still here, and speakers are still here. Um, I'll recommend you to an article by uh, Ralph Penny on the variation in Judeo-Spanish, where he speaks about retention, innovation, and simplification, and a whole variety of um, elements that have been either retained or, or simplified or invented. And I'll also just mention a few of them, since I know that there's going to be some interest in this group, about some Iberian-based uh, based characteristics. There's the etymological F, some varieties of Judeo-Spanish. And this is always, without getting into every detail about where, I'll just give you an overview about what some varieties do and at times mention, right? Um, fazer, farina, favlar. A lot of times the F is preserved, like in Portuguese, uh, and many would argue because of Portuguese. And you'll find this in some of the varieties that we saw before. Salonica, which I, I you know, the Greek variety of Judeo-Spanish, which I had mentioned to you, um, and put in uh, with the Southeast variety, actually is a little bit of Southeast and Northwest, just because of certain features that it shared, right? So Northwest varieties um, would use the F, Fazer, Farina, Favlar, and others would not. So when I said Northwest, again, that was um, areas of former Yugoslavia, Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, et cetera. Um, and Salonika also in Greece did this as well, um, but other varieties would not. So Azer, Arina, Favlar. Preservation of V, the V sound is current, uh, is used in, in Ladino, estava vido libro, as opposed to what you might find in Spanish. 
you have the retention of ha, haver, haber, chazino. But these are loan words and loans, uh, not, they're, they're, this is a sound that is found in Spanish, obviously, but it's also used now from other languages. You have the, the epithetic N in muncho for a lot or many, oftentimes. Simplification of the preterite. Um, if you're familiar with the past tense of the verb cantar, to sing, canti, cantimos, even though it's an AR verb, and bevi, bevimos, for an ER verb. Uh, realization of an issue M, as in mosotros, uh, mueve, mos, so the N is an M, oftentimes following um, when there's a defung afterward, but not always, as in the case of mosotros and mos. Vowel raising, which is a great feature um, that some varieties of Portuguese do, um, have as well, in addition to some rural varieties of Spanish. Um, so for dize, he or she says, to dizzy, that's where uh, mid vowels become high vowels. Um, Ojo to ojo as well. So O's become U's and E's become I's, often in unstressed position. And this is something that we see in a number of varieties, especially that of Rhodes, and including the communities that established themselves after they left Rhodes. Um, and metathesis, so for green, heavy, and afternoon, instead of what you might be familiar with in Spanish, verde, gordo, tarde, it's vedre, godro, and tarde. All right, so there's a lot of linguistic features that are unique to Judeo-Spanish um, and that are different than um, the Spanish that we might often compare Judeo-Spanish to. The diminutive ico, livrico for a little book, kashika for a little box, or rachalika if applied to a name for little Rachel. Not just little Rachel, but it's also a way to show uh, affection or term of endearment. Ico is um, used in some varieties of Spanish today. So it's not just a Judeo-Spanish feature by any means. All right. Aside from this, um, a very brief overview, and I can't really get into every different language family because there are so many, but Ladino is a language of contact, right? When I say Ladino, I mean Judeo-Spanish is a language of contact from Semitic languages, Romance languages, Turkic language, Germanic, Hellenic, and Slavic languages, right? Um, we spoke a little bit about the Romance faction, um, but there's more with French and Italian especially. Um, over the years. I'll say what I do want to focus on, though, is in regard to Turkish, because given that Turkish or Ottoman Turkish was the language of the Ottoman Empire where Sephardim lived, I thought it would be worthwhile to just go over some examples, select examples. Um, there are so many, and there's a great deal of scholarship in regard to each of these realms. The lexicon, the vocabulary of the language, is rich in, in Turkish elements. Kolay for easy, paras for money, mupak for kitchen. And those terms of endearment also, hanum or pasha for sweetie, or, or hanum for a female, pasha for a male, um, they each have additional meanings, especially pasha. But these are words that are used in Ladino. Ladino speakers today use these words and they might not speak Turkish. So it's also important to know that when we say they're, they're Turkish, um, but they're also Ladino. All right, verbs. They are verbs that have been incorporated into Ladino from Turkish. Englenearse, yashikear, or yakishear, um, and boyadear also. So to enjoy, to, to be fitting of, um, and boyadear, to paint. And these are all from Turkish verbs, which end in mak, but have been readapted into Ladino and conjugated accordingly. You have suffixes like li and leek, or ji and chi. And ji or chi, for example, is the... Um, Agentive one, which makes something like an occupation of sorts. So you have a zarzavachi, which is the person who sells your vegetables, a cafeji, which is maybe your barista who, who owns a coffee shop or sells a coffee shop. These are suffixes from Turkish that can be added onto Ladino words. Phonemic inventory, you know, some of these sounds I mentioned before. Um, the inventory of Ladino sounds have, has grown and shifted or expanded and changed in, over time because of contact with languages like Turkish and French and others as well. Um, expressions, your mashallah, your ishallah, your hadrasi varanas, your bamia, pasado que sega. Uh, these are all, you know, mashallah, inshallah. A lot of times I get, ooh, mashallah, that has the word Allah in it. And it can be traced to other languages other than uh, um, Turkish, of course, like Arabic. But keep in mind where the Sephardim lived for centuries. Um, this makes sense, right? And it doesn't have a religious connotation that would be off-putting. It's um, to some, it maybe, but it's this is Ladino as well. Um, so 
And then Pasado que sea has an interesting um, example as well of yes mi sol sum, because Pasado que sea is what you say to somebody, uh, it's like may it be a thing of the past when somebody's sick or ill, you wish them, you say Pasado que sea, it's a cow translation of the Turkish, which means the same thing, may it be a thing of the past. Cultural contact. Um, it's not just about the language, it's about the cultural um, elements that were also part of um, the, the centuries, right? So if we talk about Joha, Joha is the common um, storyteller. He's uh, Nasreddin Hoja, for those of you who are familiar. He's your every time, everyday town bovo, your fool who teaches you lessons and morals. And there's all sorts of great uh, folklore in regard to Joha and many books about him too. All right, as far as the Hebrew and Aramaic faction, once again, David Bunis has a, a tesoro, a treasure of a work that has to, includes over 4,000 words that he's collected in Ottoman Eastern, uh, Eastern Ottoman Judeo-Spanish. Um, and again, this is, just to give examples, this is by no means um, a comprehensive list by any means, but just to give some examples, because this class, we're exploring Jewish languages, and we might, many of you are probably not familiar with Ladino. So mazal, many of you know for luck, right? Uh, mazal bueno, mazal alto, both meaning uh, good fortune. Um, mazaloso is if you're a lucky person, but also you have words that come about that combine elements of Hebrew, but also um, Spanish. Um, mazal basho, basho, like bajo is lower. So if you call someone a mazal basho, that's not a nice word. Um, you're calling them a very low type of person, a luckless person, but you can think about how you might want to translate that. It's a, a negative word. Um, barminam is a word that uh, comes from Arab, Aramaic. Um, it's one of the more common ones that people will tell you when you think of Aramaic uh, elements in Judeo-Spanish. Barminam or barminam, there's some um, variation between the final sounds. And that just means um, heaven forbid, or literally um, far from us away from us. That's why some Ladino speakers will just say lechos. If you hear something bad, you say barminam or lechos. May that, you know, not approach us. Um, the word for Saturday is Shabbat in Ladino. You heard in the Hakatiya variety, it's Sabbat. So it's a little different in Hakatiya. But this word is, um, when we talk about the days of the week, lunes, martes, miércoles, viernes. Those are probably familiar to many of you. But the word for Saturday is Shabbat. Uh, sometimes pronounced differently, and the word for Sunday in both Eastern and Western Judeo-Spanish is um, al-chad, al-chad, um, and that has to do with an uh, Arabic, right, uh, wahad, or you could even say it's similar to Hebrew in that case, but uh, one, right, it's the first day of the week, al-chad, um, and this, you know, results in a number of interesting phenomena, such as in, in, in Ladino, you could say noche de al-chad, literally for the night of Sunday, but noche de al-chad, is Saturday night. And so you have two ways to say Saturday night in Ladino. One way is noche de al -Khan, and the other one is Shabbat a la noche. So Saturday at night, Shabbat a la noche, or noche de al -Khan, because technically, if you're going with the Jewish calendar, al -Khan begins, you know, at, on a Saturday night, right? What we might perceive as Saturday night. Um, you have different phonological adaptations, right? So for a cemetery, which is interesting that like in Hebrew, you say it's the house of the living for a cemetery, um, um, in Ladino, it's often pronounced as So it's not always a exact transfer from Hebrew as far as how it might sound. Um, Lashon, Lashon can be used in different ways in Ladino. Uh, Lashon can refer to Lashon HaKodesh for the holy language. Uh, but also when you want to echar lashon, this is kind of another um, paraphrase construction in a way, it's, it's to converse. Echar in Ladino is like to throw, to toss around. And lashon is your language or your tongue. And so it's just to, to, to converse. Echar lashon. And as another example, you have similar to like in Turkish with verbs, you have words that come from Hebrew bases. Um, or roots, we should say, that are created and adapted morphologically into Ladino. So badkar is to check. Uh, in Hebrew, you have livdok. So you take the root and you make, you know, you plug in the uh, Romance language or, or um, Spanish um, different morphemes. Uh, atakanar is to repair, and that's from litakain in Hebrew. You also have a verb like acharvar, which is, is, is kind of to beat or to strike. And similarly, the Hebrew root of cherev is um, similar um, or even a sword, right? So um, 
you have a number of morphological adaptations as well. Ah, and there's our friend Joha, <laughs> who I referenced before. All right, so writing systems. Well, the writing systems in Judeo-Spanish vary. Here's an example of Mayam Loez, which we don't we won't touch upon much today, but it's one of the works that people will tell you about when they're speaking about liter um, literary innovation and production in Ladino from 1730 onward, initiated by Yahweh of Huli, which was a commentary about uh, the Bible. Um, but you'll see that um, Ladino here is written in Rashi characters, um, Hebrew-based characters, uh, Ladino has been written in Hebrew-based characters traditionally for centuries, right? Um, whether Meruba, which is similar to the variety of Hebrew that if you are familiar with Hebrew today, but also Rashi, which was initially used to separate commentary that you might find, like for example, in the Bible. Um, so it's very similar to Meruba, but it's a bit different, Rashi. Um, and here you have another example of uh, from 1778. This was written by uh, David Atias of Sarajevo. La Guerra de Oro, um, very interesting text for a variety of reasons, but here you have a mix of titles, which are often in Meruba, and then the content itself, uh, the main text, which are in Rashi characters as well. Um, you know, periodicals, and when we think about periodicals, now when we think about newspapers, for example, we think about online newspapers, printed newspapers, but when we think about periodicals, um, you know, they could be dailies, coming out daily, they could be weeklies or even monthlies. And Judeo-Spanish has, or has had, more than 300 periodicals throughout the, the life of the language, the life of the Sephardim. Most clearly, yes, most clearly um, prior to the Holocaust, we'll speak about that a little bit later. Um, this is definitely a fun fact because for most people, it's like how many, lang how many different periodicals could this language or these communities have? That, but they were so spread out. And here, again, if I'm saying there are 300 and Gaon actually, lists all of them. <laughs> um, in, his work is in Hebrew. Um, here's just a sample. Um, La Epoca from Salonica, El Tiempo from Istanbul, La Alborada from Sarajevo, and La Vara from New York City. Uh, some of these were more short-lived short than others, right? Sarajevo's La Alborada only, only lasted for a little over a year, um, but others were long-lasting for decades. And as I mentioned, the different cities in question, you know, El Tiempo, which started in the late later in the 19th century, so the late 1800s, you know, Constantinople. You'll see the different borders and, and names changing, which I'll just use modern day ones for the sake of this presentation. But even in New York City, you had well over a dozen. I mean, depending on the different iterations, closer to 20 newspapers in New York City, once Sephardim started to settle here, Ladino speaking Sephardim, I should mention, primarily at the end of the 1800s or mostly within the first quarter of the 1900s. Um, and a lot, and some of these are, I should mention, are freely accessible. Uh, through the National Library of Israel's platform. So I highly encourage you to check it out and to explore, explore, explore. I mean, dissertations galore. I mean, information just waiting to be explored um, and really no time to do so when you think about it with all the content. But so Letreo, which is, I think it's just a fun part of the Ladino experience because while many of you indicated that you understood what you heard with Eastern or Western Judeo-Spanish. If I were to show you a document like this, this side of the document, whether or not you speak Hebrew, um, most likely you are not going to be able to read this. And I've done this with a number of speakers and readers of Hebrew. Like this is based on the Hebrew alphabet, but it's the cursive variety. Soletreo is the cursive variety. It's from Soletra, of Portuguese or Galician to, um, to spell out. Um, Soletreo, also has been referred to as ganchos for hooks. If you're familiar with Hebrew and you write and read Hebrew, the Hebrew script that is used is not the same as this script. So here we simply have, it is written from right to left. Um, you'll see here, um, oh, let me go back a second. Souvenir de vuestros genitores que pensan siempre en ti. Moshe Hassan. Um, most speakers of Ladino cannot read their documents that are in attics and basements that their families left behind. And we'll speak a little bit about that later. Um, but so it's, it's something that um, was used for centuries in variation. I mean, think about your handwritings. Some of us write more neatly than others. Um, reading a document in Solotreo is an art. It's paleography. It's 
being able to have patience and being able to decipher material. And in, for the most cases, not being able to go back and ask somebody what they wrote, right? Because these are from a long time ago, most of these documents. These scripts are not used today, right? Ladino is typically not, Ladino is not written in Solofeo today. Um, and it's very rare to find in Rashi or Merubah print as well. Um, for anyone interested, though, I will say, you know, I'm speaking to you today about Judeo-Spanish, but I'm also speaking to you as someone who's highly involved in working with speakers of the language, uh, really throughout the world. But one project or platform I do want to mention that I, I spearheaded was documenting Judeo-Spanish. And I think it's a nice resource for people um, to learn uh, about or to practice or to upkeep their soletreo. Um, so if you're interested, I would encourage you to go to documentingjudeospanish.com. You'll see a character map. And you also see 25 different documents um, that we have many more to upload. But what you could do, what's unique about this is that you can take your mouse over any word that you're not familiar with. And a little tool tip will appear. This, that's what's pada here. Uh, and then if you don't know what pada means, you can click on pada and it will tell you the English translation. So it's a good opportunity if you're interested in learning more about this script that so few, especially uh, Ladino speakers, are able to navigate today. Um, moving forward, you know, for a variety of reasons, Ladino is now written in uh, Roman characters, uh, Latin characters, in Romanization, transcription form. Um, this started decades ago. A lot of this was due to the shifting politics of the Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey with Ataturk in particular in the 1920s, where even um, Ottoman Turkish, which used an Arabic alphabet, had to switch to Latin characters as well. So Ladino today, if we want to fast forward, has been written in, in Latin characters in variation, right? If you knew Turkish, you might write it more you know, in Turkish style using Latin characters. Um, there is a norm today that is used by Akiyaru Shalayim, the Journal of the National Authority of Israel, um, starting in 1979, or really the late 1970s. And you know how I mentioned before that there were 300 periodicals in Ladino, once upon a time, or Judeo-Spanish, some variety? Today, there's only one that's printed. So, I'm glad that there's still one. And this is one that's extremely active. El Amanacer printed monthly. It's a monthly, but it's a supplement to the Shalom newspaper, which prints more regularly. So that's important to know. That's been in existence for decades. But El Amanacer is a Latino-only newspaper. Uh, you could subscribe now digitally, which is great, and or receive the mailings once a month. And so, you know, when you see a word like cultura, um, culture, you know, for those of you who are new to Latino but know Spanish, you might say, why is that written with a K? You're going to see a lot of Ks. You're going to see things that look familiar and things that don't. Um, but for many people, reading a text in Latin character in Ladino is much more accessible than reading a text in Solotreo or even Meruba or Rashi, right? Okay. So let's move right along to sociolinguistic variation. And really all I can say here, uh, other than a lot, is that, you know, if you were able to read the article, you know, Sarah asked each of us to submit an article in regards to a reading, a potential reading that you might be interested to prepare for this class. I was uh, reading um, an article that I wrote about the sociolinguistics of Judeo-Spanish, which is extremely complex given all the factors that I've mentioned before. But just a, a, as a brief overview, and again, Eunice has written extensively on this, um, you know, when we talk about language variation, or what is sociolinguistics, we're, not, we're talking about how is language used in society? How is it perceived? How is it produced? Um, and within the community and really beyond. Um, so we can think about things like socioeconomic status or just class, the wealthier, the middle class, the poor, the lower classes, for example, the rabbinic class. These different groups might have, well, will have spoken different varieties of Judeo-Spanish. Uh, the rabbinic faction, for example, which there is overlap between, they don't exist, you know, in bubbles, like the education and literacy did have to do with these different groupings. The rabbinic class or faction, especially among men, were more familiar with Hebrew and Aramaic, and therefore would incorporate additional vocabulary or features into their Judeo-Spanish than maybe women who didn't have the same opportunities traditionally to become as educated. Um, so these are things that we'll see. Um, throughout uh, Judeo-Spanish and exploring it. You know, as far as studies, there's a number of studies that have to do with, a number of studies have to do with sex, really, in regards to men versus women, and not so much gender. Some do, but, you know, gender as how do we express ourselves um, uh, in Ladino, and what does that mean? You know, there's a, a nice amount of talk today about um, people learning Ladino and maybe using certain words that might sound, you know, these are words that women would use more than uh, men. And so there's differences as far as 
um, men speaking Ladino or women speaking Ladino um, overlap, of course. Age is another factor that's important to consider, um, younger versus older. I will say that most speakers of the language today are older, but once upon a time, this wasn't the case. Families, entire families spoke Ladino. So that's something important to keep in mind. And there was a number of um, uh, points of variation. Mononowski, Romero, and others have written about um, age as a factor in Ladino and location. I mean, that's what we saw before with differentiating Eastern and Western and, and further um, varieties of the language. Uh, it's not just where one is born, it's where one grows up, it's, it's with whom one establishes contact as well. Um, things like code switching, things like um, Im implementing elements of maybe other languages as well. Um, and accommodating also, language accommodation is also part of that. So there's myriad features and factors that go into the sociolinguistics of Judeo-Spanish, um, which are important to consider because it's not a monolithic construct, right? It has a lot of variation. And you can make a life studying it and learning it and clearly speaking it. Um, another study, you know, um, that I want to draw your attention to was one that I did in regard to uh, language socialization and intergenerational transmission of the language um, in the 21st century. Well, I'll speak a little bit about Ladino today um, in, in the next part of this class, but tying it into previous segments, it's an endangered language. It's still a living language, but it's very rare to find speakers of different ages. So this one study that I did, which appeared in the Heritage Language Journal, um, tracked three generations of speakers, a grandmother, la nona, la tia, right? Her two daughters, la tia, la madre, and then the, ma the mother's daughters, la bajora, la hermanica, um, who had lived and grew up in different places. And it's just, for me, I mean, it was fun to write, but it's a fascinating case of a family of three generations that still speak Ladino, today, um, and in this case, it was only from a couple of years ago where this was done, and you know, how does their Ladino differ? Um, why do the younger generations use their Ladino? What does it mean to use Ladino in the 21st century? With whom? How does age enter into that? You'll notice that all the people that I interviewed for the five for the study were women. Does that have anything to do with Ladino being spoken today? So these are things that are going to come up and be part of those discussions. And then in regard to contemporary status of Ladino, well, um, Sarah indicated when um, she spoke about the different levels using the ethnologues criteria, uh, Ladino can range from a 7 to an 8B, so, so from shifting to moribund to nearly extinct. If we look at, you know, Ladino in uh, maybe, well, in Bosnia, where there are less than a handful of speakers, uh, there were four, but now there are fewer because some have passed, you know, that's nearly extinct. There's some varieties that aren't even accounted for in the ethnologue, right? So it shifts based on different factors. It's always hard to figure out how many speakers there are. And it's one of the first questions that I get on a regular basis. And I'd probably ask it too, if I were interested in learning about a language, but it's extremely hard to quantify. The ethnologue lists 51,016 as of recently, um, based on the different pieces of information that it has, but, there's other estimates that go beyond 100,000. I've seen estimates of several hundred thousand, but it's important to keep in mind, like what are we, what are we reporting on? The number of Sephardim in the world? The number of people who have a Sephardic family member at some point? The people who know some Ladino? What does it mean to know Ladino? What does it mean to know a Jewish language? So this is a very hard question for anyone to answer, right? There's no census that says who speaks Ladino around the world. And then post vernacular activity, right? There's a great deal, and this is something Sarah mentioned also. There's a lot of post vernacular, or even vernacular, but post vernacular activity in recent years, and especially since the pandemic. So I'll just mention a couple of things, and I want to save time for questions. The Holocaust, why is Ladino even in danger? The Holocaust. This is not just, I mean, it's not just an Ashkenazi narrative or experience. Sephardic Jews um, in Greece, in areas of um, Yugoslav, former Yugoslavia, were decimated, and along with them, went their language as well. So it's important to keep in mind. But apart from this, um, I should note that um, accommodation and assimilation, whether it was in Turkey um, during Atatürk Turk's term of Atanas Turk, uh, uh, citizens speak Turkish, or even the politics of Hebrew in Israel to, to be um, Israeli, people left their languages behind. Um, and even in the United States, um, Los Angeles had one article, one newspaper called El Mesagero, a very short-lived newspaper. And in the 1930s, the editors were encouraging their population of Sephardim uh, in an article, why the messenger should also publish in English, saying, ya basta, like, let's learn English and be American. So, so many different factors um, that have promulgated the use of um, 
or the abandonment of the language. There's an academy. Um, aside from that, though, there's a lot of activity today. The National Authority of Ladino was established in Israel. There's um, a national, another national academy through the uh, Real Academia Española. Uh, there's a Shadarim project that I'm involved with as well. There are several universities around the world that offer Ladino. There are textbooks in Ladino. There are numerous opportunities to learn Ladino online, especially since the onset of the pandemic. And then there are books. There's a lot of creativity and creation and production in the language. Um, there's a camp in, in Washington that uh, is for kids that infuses uh, elements of Ladino throughout. There are books specifically for children. There are, are choirs for children. There are, are artists who specifically focus their work on new production of Ladino. And there are people who are creating art in Ladino as well. There's a radio station in Ladino as well. And it's post vernacular because these speakers are all speakers of other languages as well. And Ladino is used not just because it's Ladino, but for purposes, right, um, to help preserve the language. The Little Prince, which some of you are familiar with, has a variety in Eastern Judeo-Spanish and just published recently was the one in Hakatia as well. And there are so many opportunities and um, examples of post-vernacular engagement. Ladino Comunita, established by Rachel Bortnick in, in Texas, but originally from Izmir, is one prime example um, as well of an online listserv that exclusively operates in Ladino for the past 23 years. Um, and if we fast forward, there are Facebook groups, there are celebrations of Ladino, Ladino days, groups, classes for speakers and learners. Every Sunday since the pandemic started, there's more than 100 encontros de Alhat for Sunday meetups. And every week it's a different uh, topic with a balabai, a host, and a musafir, a guest. So from Hebrew and Turkish, those two words. Um, and there are also initiatives to, um, I'll play this a little bit later, but there are initiatives to get people together and sing online. Uh, during the pandemic, there was all these people that came together to sing and share their language and um, engage in some really meaningful opportunities to use the language, to learn the language, and to preserve the language. So with that being said, I thank you for your time. Alermos.